Uh, my name is Kelsey Wolfcloud. I serve as the manager of LGSCC and SEEK through CivicWell. Uh, next slide. Before we dive in, I wanna familiarize everyone with the two CivicWell programs that are co-hosting today's um, webinar. First is the LGSCC. LGSCC works to advance local government leadership on clean energy and climate resilience through regulatory action and programs. LGSCC's membership, sorry, uh, network has successfully orchestrated the formation of local government partnerships, regional energy networks, and community choice aggregations. You can learn about more about membership in LJCC at ljcc.org. Next slide. Next is the California Climate and Energy Collaborative. SEEK serves as a hub for energy efficiency and sustainability news, information, best practices, and resources relevant to California's local governments. Doing so, SEEK aims to support California local government's efforts to save energy, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and accelerate climate action by building knowledge and network amongst local government practitioners. You can learn more about the service that we, services that we offer at eecoordinator.info. Next slide. LGSNC, LGSCC and SEEK are sister programs um, offering different but complementary services that we think you should all be taking advantage of. We'll be sending some links in the chat so you can stay connected with our resources and various offerings, sign up for our email lists, and get in touch with us. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to today's moderator, Mark Costa, who serves, who serves as the co-chair of LGSCC and is the director of policy and planning at the Energy Coalition. You can take it away, Mark. All right. Well, welcome. I mean, we're climbing up to like 100 participants, so that's really good. Um, so today we're going to go through a couple emerging topics. Um, you know, and I can definitely say that this is, um, you know, a really exciting webinar for me. This has um, been able to really be exposed to a lot of new ideas. And, you know, we're all, you know, beating the drum in terms of or going down the field or whatever analogy you want to use on you know, the, this high DER transition. And we all have the same vision. We all know what the goal is, what our 2045 targets are and the Senate bills and all that stuff here in California. But articulating what that vision is and getting that picture um, out of, you know, some text on a page and really painting that picture um, is really important. And we have um, a really good panel of people that can stake out the corners of that. And hopefully this is a springboard um, into where we're headed as an industry and where um, all um, people interested in local government action can get some of these ideas and we can run with and we can really um, find out where we want to go from here and learn learn from others. Um, and I can definitely assure you that uh, these are some of the world uh, thought leaders in this. And even as I'm sitting here at midnight in Europe, I mean, we're I'm hearing um, all these different ideas and questions that I think the panel today can really um, answer, um, or at least give you uh, some food for thought. So we're going to have the presenter self-introduce. Um, you know, it's going to be really exciting to have, um, and I'll go through from, from left to right here, uh, Mark Patterson, who um, I've really had the pleasure of meeting through the Gridwise Architecture Council, just um, a, a wealth of knowledge um, in many aspects and um, Mark, I'm sure you're going to self-introduce yourself, but really, really um, interesting work you've done in Australia and thoughts that are globally applicable and that we can take um, to heart here in California. Uh, you know, Barry has been um, at it for a long time in local government action in San Francisco. We've had many emails on everything from benchmarking to building performance standards and now electrification and grid impacts in, in cities. Um, Melanie as well, I've recently met through, again, the Gridwise Architecture Council um, and just fascinating work on how um, at the federal level, microgrids are being approached and these common and unique barriers that are being faced when it comes to developing microgrids. And there's some really ambitious targets um, that we could all really learn from and say, wow, if, if that's happening there, like, why are we not doing it? Or how can we get on that path or accelerate, you know, a lot of us, what we're already doing. And then Steven's been just a, a real innovator in terms of what we've been doing. Um, and some of our work at the energy coalition in terms of um, our advanced energy communities, although we're not working together on that, really pushing the envelope on what's possible to bring the energy transition to everyone. 
and really figuring out what that takes, what the benefits are, and the business models, and how to really navigate that. So we're going to really round this out from A to Z, a global perspective, local government perspective, federal perspective, technical, non-technical philosophy, business models, the, the whole nine yards. That's why we have an hour and a half. We do want to reserve time for Q&A. So please, um, just the volume of people on today and the nature of you know, just managing the questions, if you could type them in, um, and Kelsey or John, just give the instructions, whether it's uh, Q and A or or chat, you know, I always get confused on that, but we'll we'll manage that. We'll put some instructions in there. Kelsey, chime in before I hand it over. Um, but I really appreciate okay. everybody um, self introducing themselves on the panel, but also through uh, the chat, like you're already doing. Sorry, I'll just really quickly um, reiterate that it'll be through the Q and A um, through the Q and A. So be sure to add okay. in any questions that you have as we go through. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So let's queue up the first speaker slides and we'll get into it from there. All right, Mark. Righty. Um, I'm hoping that uh, the audio is coming through okay then. We hear you and we see your slides. Uh, now they just went into full screen. So you're, you're good to go. Perfect. Thanks so much. Well, thanks, uh, thanks so much for the uh, invitation, Mark, to present today. Uh, really good to connect with you all. It's obviously, uh, what is it, uh, gee, Wednesday, Thursday here, so um, uh, I'm losing track of, of the time, but um, uh, really good to uh, connect. So obviously speaking on the topic of uh, grid modernization and global insights uh, and, and with regard to local solutions, um, obviously, Mark Patterson is my name, uh, head up a small uh, specialist consulting uh, firm that works globally uh, on uh, whole of energy system transformation with a particular focus on power systems. Um, and uh, you'll get a feel for the kind of work that we do that, that Mark's touched on uh, as I go through the presentation. Um, Australia, in a lot of ways, is kind of a... Um, canary in the coal mine, for lack of a better uh, analogy, um, in terms of the transformation, as you'll see uh, in some of the things that I share uh, today. Uh, so jumping right in. Um, so really, you know, what you'll see here just in this little animation is uh, the fact that we all know that grids are, are fundamentally transforming uh, internationally. Our legacy grids are very much uh, one directional bulk supply uh, delivery systems. Um, and our emerging future power systems are, are transforming into the kind of uh, ecosystem that you can see there where you've got both ends of the system uh, becoming uh, far more uh, interdependent uh, in terms of uh, the operation of a, a deeply decarbonized much more dynamic uh, power system. And I think one of the really critical questions, even at the get-go of uh, this kind of presentation, is that we all have spent, you know, if you've been in this general area for a while, we've all spent a lot of time thinking about a lot of the different uh, possibilities and technologies uh, and so on. And there's no lack of really cool things that we can do. But one of the most fundamental questions in all of this is the one that you've got on screen now, which is how in the world do we think about changing a hundred year old system? Uh, for me, that's one of the most critical questions um, in this whole space. And how do we do that uh, at the scale and pace that we, we need to? In Australia, if you've been to Sydney, you'll be familiar with the Sydney Harbour Bridge, of course. And, and uh, you know, when we, think about uh, change, a primary way, you know, when we think about change in Australia, and I know most of the world in this sector, we use what, what we refer to as a present forward approach to change. Um, we kind of start from 100% fossil fuel based system, and we increment our way forward in hopes that that will perhaps uh, get us to something like a net zero emissions uh, future. Uh, but it's a big perhaps, and there's a lot of question marks. And in fact, I would put it to you that it is impossible to get from 
using solely that present forward model of change. So anything like the future that our policymakers say that at societal levels we're actually uh, seeking to achieve. Um, you know, one way of thinking about this is our energy system operator adopted a diagram from some work that I, to, to I had the privilege of co-authoring with, <clears throat> excuse me, fellow Californian, uh, in your case, uh, Paul Martini, Jeff, Jeff Taft and others. And this kind of really highlights that the nature of this transformation from a fossil fuel based system to net zero emissions <clears throat> system is not just some beautiful uh, continuous line of transition, but it involves um, a number of major uplifts in the capability of the system um, and uh, a fundamental step change or set of step changes that are not incremental tweaks between the 100 year old past and the you know, provisioning the system for the next decades uh, to come. Um, and, you know, one way of thinking about that is that, you know, as we think about, as you think about in California and other parts of the United States, one of the most basic things about how we even make sense of the transformation we're all trying to deal with is, well, just like when you um, <clears throat> book an Uber, um, you need to know at least two things. Um, but where are we now? And often that's you know, under, under contest with the as-built power system. Where are we actually trying to go? So in other words, if our policymakers are saying we're going to achieve X outcome by Y date, then what does that actually look like in terms of a uh, set of um, buildable, um, operable um, capabilities, if you like? So where are we going in the target future? And then most importantly, in a 100-year-old system, you can't actually get there by moving purely from present forward. You need actually to reverse engineer that journey from the future state that you are converging on collectively and then reverse engineer that from the future back. Um, and, um, and so one way of thinking about that is that as you all are kind of wrestling with how, how do we uh, achieve major step changes in the trans transformation of our power systems, uh, it is absolutely mission critical to bring a theory of change, a model of change to policymakers, to regulators and so on, that uh, brings both these perspectives of respecting the past, you know, the system that's been built from the present forward, but absolutely uh, developing a much more robust societal process around future back. In other words, what is the system we need if President Biden and, you know, the state governor have certain ambitions, how does that need to show up uh, in reality? And then how do we reverse engineer that journey? So coming to the sort of, you know, zeroing in as we sort of move towards, well, what, what is the role of local solutions in this kind of transforming power system? And one of the next things to kind of understand that I find is really important is, well, what exactly are these power systems that we're trying to transform? And some very simple ways of thinking about it is that um, it is, while this is not simple, it's kind of very illuminating in the sense that part of the complexity of transforming these things is our power systems are some of the most complex systems humans have ever created. Um, and they're not one system, uh, they actually consist of seven different structures that are overlaid that you can see there from some work that Pacific Northwest National Labs in, uh, in uh, the US has done. Um, and you can see the different structures that make up the system. And I won't bore you with all the detail in this presentation for sake of time, but just suffice to say that as we transform these systems, we need to understand how they're configured today. In many cases, in most jurisdictions, we don't. We don't have a single set of documents that articulate even how all of these structures are configured. And we certainly need to know that so that we can actually transform the system to do all of the very different things we want it to do as we move forward. And that's because the power system, as we saw in that little animation at the start, has really moved from this very, uh, you know, decades old sort of supply chain model one directional bulk delivery system made up of very distinct functional silos. 
And over to the right, as you may have noticed, there's this kind of thing called the demand side, which is actually where all those pesky humans uh, are, um, you know, uh, that in a sense, we've almost related to this system as if humans exist to help optimize the power system. Whereas actually last time we all checked, I think the power system exists to serve humans, people, citizens, societies. Um, and, and But nevertheless, this is the system we've inherited. What we're now trying to do is take exactly that system and bolt on any number of changes to try and decarbonize and add in DERs and you know, distributed storage and so on. And guess what? Um, when you come to a jurisdiction like Australia where we've got just out of control uptake of all of these resources, that whole model starts to really break down. So how are our power systems changing? Okay, so in Australia, um, we already have the world leading levels of distributed uh, energy resources. So we have regions that have 50% uptake or more of uh, rooftop solar. We have um, whole states now, South Australia in particular, where um, during the daytime hours uh, on low load days, 100% or more of all demand is served by local generation. So in other words, there is no supply from the transmission system during the middle of the day. Um, at the very same 24 hour period that evening, um, as the sun has gone down, uh, those areas are uh, almost 100% supplied by the centralized system. So there's kind of almost tidal dynamic. Um, and if that wasn't enough, by 2050, uh, where we're heading, just in one of our major scenarios, step change scenario is 9X utility scale wind and solar, 5X or already world leading levels of rooftop solar, 3X new dispatchable firming capacity, 99% of electrification of transport. So this is kind of a crazy different kind of future state that I actually find in the sector most of the time we have this kind of almost collective insanity where on the one hand, we kind of talk up all the cool stuff we're doing and we, and we talk about the kind of big decarbonized future. But then when you actually look at what we're practically doing at our desks the very next day in the sector, it doesn't all add up to getting to the future state that we've just talked a big game about. You know, and I think that's one of the really critical issues here. And if that wasn't enough, one of our other scenarios is our hydrogen superpower scenario, which is literally just entirely off the chart, as you can see here. So this is, this is not incremental change. This is not tweaks. This is radical transformation of a 100-year-old system that has served us well, but needs to be fundamentally reconfigured. Um, not rebuilt. I'm not talking about kind of some kind of let's pretend the system doesn't exist. Uh, but actually, we need the smarts to, to understand how to do this well and keep the lights on. And as I said, but as per that earlier uh, um, animation, what we've actually got as this goes forward is a power system that requires on an entirely new level of dynamic whole system interdependence. Obviously, this presentation has got a strong emphasis on local uh, solutions. So what you notice about this diagram is that to the right are all of the local solutions. Um, and all of those local solutions are no longer just some kind of nice add-on, you know, let's all talk a big game about how much we love our customers or whatever. But it's actually that consumers and communities um, are becoming, they're no longer a demand side. That's the wrong term now. We still use it, but it's the wrong term because they're actually becoming a major source of supply, a major source of storage, of flexibility and so on. And so the system as a whole, as we go forward, unless we're gonna repeal the laws of physics um, or fight the laws of physics, the what we used to call the demand side becomes an absolutely pivotal part of a system, an entire end one system that uh, is far more volatile and needs tons of more, um, demand side or customer side flexibility. And just one other slide here too is some work we've done has really just highlighted 
The one of the other challenges of this is this is not just a technical system, it's not just an economic system, it's a socio-techno-economic system, which is another complexity in changing it. And customers and societies have a whole range of different things that we expect from our power systems, which have their own local manifestations as well. And so this is just a bit of a, a window into the range of different trade-offs that we need to make as we move forward. So, okay, last major point here is, so what are the opportunities for local and modular energy solutions? Um, and so I guess the first thing is, let's just make sure we're clear on what, what problem we're solving. So coming back to this diagram up in the top right, the reality is as our power systems everywhere, and certainly in the United States, as you are pushing towards uh, deep decarbonization, those these systems actually become radically more volatile because variable renewable energy by definition is highly variable. At the same time, we're actually withdrawing our major sources of traditional system flexibility called um, AKA coal-fired, dispatchable coal-fired generation, other sources of fossil fuel generation. What that means is that the system as we go forward in every state, in every jurisdiction, unless we're going to fight the laws of physics, the bulk power, the transmission, the distribution systems, and the rapidly expanding fleet of distributed resources must be made capable of functioning far more dynamically and holistically end-to-end -end if we're going to enable secure, cost-efficient, and self-balancing power systems. So this is like... So what we're saying here is that local solutions are not some kind of add-on, they're not some nice to have, you know, uh, they are they are becoming a fundamentally critical physics-based reality in the system. And that's because just as exhibit A, in a power system, you still need to be able to balance uh, supply and demand instantaneously every microsecond of the year. If you've got a more volatile system, that's less flexible because you're uh, withdrawing so much of your dispatchable generation. All of that flexibility needs to come from somewhere. And a lot of it, a ton of it needs to come from a much more interactive uh, customer end of the system. One other perspective on that is that the way of coordinating the system used to be relatively simple. You had hundreds of large generators um, that you just managed from the central market system operator. That's now becoming radically more complex as in the Australian context, as we get tons of resources showing up at the polar opposite end of the system, the coordination process becomes more Frankenstein-like. It needs to transition to um, a much more uh, layered and modular approach in which you can actually coordinate and leverage all of those resources. Um, and those layered architectures to actually make this all possible are, uh, are actually key, they're both key to enabling the decarbonized grid we say we're creating, but they're in, they intrinsically support a much more modular approach to involving microgrids and DERs. So the simple point here is that you've actually got what this seeks to illustrate is these red nodes, if you like, are points of uh, responsibility where you've got a distribution network responsible for managing this part of the, the system. But the, underneath that, you've got a whole bunch of microgrids and DERs that are responsible for managing their behaviors and their interactions with the system. In other words, you've got layers of responsibility in which different parts of the system can collectively interact to deliver that end-to-end -end self balancing system. And so in conclusion, um, all of this actually requires one of the most fundamental transformations of all, and that is the, the shift from 20th century grid-centric regulation to 21st century customer-centric and community-centric regulation. And some of this is, is actually developed further in these three papers, particularly the, the gambit for uh, grid 2035 to the left which are all of these are linked in the slides that you'll receive. Um, so I will finish at that point. Thank you. All right. Well, Mark, as always, um, just a lot to digest. People are going to chew on that. And um, the slides will be available um, 
and the network of structures is really important. And, and to drill down into that, we're going to transition to our next speaker in terms of um, what Barry has um, found through some of the analysis that um, you've done locally in San Francisco. So you've seen the, the gambit um, and there's more to come, right? There's like this unknown like phase of that. Um, so to like connect what, you know, Mark has done with, with Barry is that there's customers that are critically important and there's things that we're doing as local governments, passing ordinances and doing support and running programs through RENs. Um, and these are all coming together and, you know, Barry's thinking ahead about that and we're not quite as far as Australia has gotten, but we're preparing for it. So this is, um, bringing it locally. Um, so Barry, take it away. Great. Well, thanks, Mark. Uh, and uh, my uh, setting son of a head, uh, happy to join you and uh, apologize to everybody in advance for Mark having set, both Marks having set up expectations quite by that eye. Uh, but uh, we were, we're often faced by a question, and you can go ahead and advance to the next slide. Uh, as we advance local electrification policy, you know, uh, the, a lot of different stakeholders will note that there's a challenge with the existing grid, uh, either outages or just, you know, general concerns, and they'll suggest, hey, maybe we should delay electrification until some undefined future state when the grid is ready. And um, this was a chance to kind of add some context to that, to that, whether that argument makes sense specifically in San Francisco and um, drawing upon some, uh, some somewhat unique set of public records that we have. Um, so next slide, please. Um, we are gonna talk a bit about uh, the nature of the problem that we are attempting to solve here, uh, some resources that we had to address it and what we found. <clears throat> Next slide. And I'll just confess that that last image was not as authentically from San Francisco as Mark's uh, great image of the construction of uh, the Harbor Bridge. Um, a couple of years ago, we began working with stakeholders to uh, really formulate strategies for how exactly we would move forward with some goals that were set by um, Marilyn and Breed, and then were codified in Chapter Nine of our Environment Code. So they're they're formal city goals adopted in legislation uh, to de decarbonize uh, economy wide in San Francisco to net zero emissions by 2040, and to uh, the same goal, but for large commercial buildings by 2035. And so, in talking with stakeholders about you know what those goals meant to them, what the practicalities were. We did identify these two key points of consensus that you know we have shared risk uh, from uh, failure to act on, on, on climate change and um, that we also will share in the benefit of that, uh, both in terms of investment and in terms of you know, safer, healthier uh, lives. Next slide, please. Um, so I mentioned a couple of these already, but we also have a interim goals to reduce emissions to 61% by 2030. And what does that exactly that mean? Uh, next slide, please. Um, really, it boils down to we have um, had the benefit of California's efficiency standards, uh, technology change, uh, private sector leadership, uh, just a, a, a great set of resources in investing in improving the efficiency of our existing building stock. And, and progress on that front, as well as California's renewable portfolio standards. And you know, like, like a growing number of California communities, a CCA that now is the principal uh, generation procurement entity for San Francisco and provides, uh, is approaching or providing 100% renewable power depending on the, the year. Um, and so the question is if we're, as with the emissions from buildings have declined, uh, declined more than 52% since 1990 here in San Francisco. And the uh, today, the operation of buildings uh, is responsible for, uh, sorry, natural gas consumption is responsible for about uh, 80, 86 to 92% of <clears throat> emissions from the operation of buildings. Well, are we ready to make the next steps to transition to uh, electrification? 
And in California, we've benefited from a great deal of discussion about uh, how, when, and why to make those changes in residential buildings. And this was a unique chance to look at commercial buildings where stakeholders expressed the same concerns, but we didn't have the same body of uh, publications to help them uh, weigh those risks. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and really, in some contrast to you know the great remarks that uh, Mark Patterson offered us, um, we were trying to look very narrowly at you know what are the the responsibilities of specific stakeholders, and to ask you know what what do they need and what do we all need to understand given those responsibilities. So really viewing the role of the building owner is is not necessarily understanding the broader electric system and its evolution, but their building needs to get electrified. And they have you know, operational needs to satisfy the, the purpose for which they operate their building. But the utility has a fundamental responsibility of, of overall customer service and safety. Cities you know, are widely acknowledged. You know, we, we're responsible for supporting a healthy economy and providing safe uh, and you know, wonderful places for people to live and work. And we have the benefit of our partners over at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory uh, who had some um, some unique uh, analytic resources for us? Next slide, please. <laughs> and you know, we had an, also a fundamental observation that if we start with an expectation that um, widespread electrification would require first it would require substantial investment in the grid, that would pose a very serious problem to um, any sort of quick transition because you know, just planning out grid changes, let alone constructing them, is very time intensive, certainly financially intensive, uh, gets more complex as time goes by, and happens to not be an issue that the local government typically directly manages, uh, particularly when served primarily by an investor-owned utility, so San Francisco served by pg and &E. um, On the other hand, local government land use planning does actually look at infrastructure uh, in that's widely recognized in new development, that planning out the horizontal infrastructure is a critical precursor to developing or redeveloping a significant area. And so really this widespread electrification and this issue of uncertainty about is the grid ready to accommodate just basic electrification at scale um, really is a very similar analogous problem where we think bringing local government's land use planning and community engagement capacity is, is extremely helpful and really necessary for the type of scale we're aiming for. Next slide. So to the question was, could we avoid grid infrastructure improvements? What could today's grid handle? And, some, and California also has a strong bias to keep a lot of different sorts of information uh, private for a variety of reasons. Um, in part, information about detailed information about the electric grid is, you know, information that's of value to the utility. So they may not share, may wish to not share just for their own proprietary interest. There also are concerns about uh, terrorism or other um, you know, disruption of the grid, the more that the public knows. Luckily, that argument has uh, shifted in recent years in favor of if we're going to support solar deployment, we need to provide basic public information about the capacity of today's grid to accommodate those resources. And so we did actually have reasonably detailed information that we could where we could identify business districts in San Francisco where just public data provided by PG&E at the direction of the CPUC tells us exactly that, like what is the capacity of today's grid? And we had a working assumption that we'd been to each of these places and we've seen all these buildings in operation. And so the, where our working assumption was today's grid was working as intended. It may be aging, may need updating, but um, the power's on. Uh, the other key source of information we had was from energy benchmarking, energy audits, and decarbonization plans that local stakeholders are obliged to make due to a longstanding law in San Francisco. So we knew how much energy these buildings were using and what sort of equipment was in them. And all this could sound really basic in Australia, but that's a kind of exceptional level of insight in, in, in California due to this, um, partly the disaggregation of the data itself and partly this bias toward um, keeping a lot of different resources confidential unless proven to be needed. Next slide. Um, we also had 
basic public records. Uh, we understand how the buildings are used, uh, when they were constructed and, and renovated. You know, so what is the equipment inside them? Uh, next slide, please. And so therefore we could put those pieces together with the help of Lawrence Berkeley National Lab to quantify what you know today's state and then what would be the effect of electrifying all of those buildings in a given business district, district? Would it, could it be accommodated by today's existing electric grid? And so that methodology had a, quite a bit of technical detail to it, but it really boils down to these three activities. If you could advance one notch, we identify where we're gonna evaluate. And we chose, one of the places we chose is Fisherman's Wharf, just as a globally recognizable location, as well as a place that had uh, a mixture of commercial uses. Next slide. We had our local land use data and next, advance please. And we had this data about capacity. So we could look at what was the, um, we could develop a model for every one of these buildings. We could calibrate it based on the public records of its their energy use. And then we could look at different scenarios for um, modifying those buildings according to our public policy goals. Next slide. And we did that again, also in the design district, but I didn't have a quite as nifty of an image because you might be less likely to be familiar with that part of town. Um, <clears throat> LBNL's analysis, it, you, of course, we've all, many of us probably have worked with energy models before. A critique can be, you know, how well they represent the real world. So the two things we were doing uh, together in this project was, again, using the benchmarking data. So we did have a you know, strong constraint of you know, how these buildings were performing in reality, as well as um, a method LBNL had a pilot on a prior project to um, stochastically simulate the variation in human behavior. So in other words, they have some, some, some noise. It's a very sophisticated way of adding some noise to represent um, normal variation from building to building and, and their usage in day-to-day. -day. And so we calibrate a baseline and then we applied some fundamental electric electrification measures. Uh, next slide. Um, and then we looked at what would happen if we aggregated up that 10 minute data across buildings to what would be the effect at the district level and ask you know, how does at both annual energy use, daily energy use, and peak demand, how do they change over time? Next slide. And then uh, the measures that we looked at uh, were you know, the fundamentals. So they were basic uh, electrification. Uh, it do, did involve bringing the, or installing equipment that is con generally consistent with current code. Uh, so there's an efficiency benefit inherent to replacing aging infrastructure with current equipment. But um, otherwise, we were not making aggressive assumptions about the efficiency of equipment that be selected. And then similarly, we did also have a number of efficiency measures that were all you know, very much on the shelf, state of the shelf technology and not uh, advanced DERs, just looking at what would happen if we, we really uh, made an effort to reduce load concurrent with uh, electrification. Next slide. This also did not take into account solar or EV charges. We're really just trying to get some insight of this question. Are we going to break the grid by electrifying? Because that was a recurring concern from stakeholders. And so we looked at four <clears throat> scenarios of just basic electrification, uh, leaving the buildings mixed fuel, but doing some efficiency measures just for context, um, efficient electrification. And, uh, and, and the outcome was, you know, ultimately, again, updating from equipment near end of life, uh, installed in a prior years or prior eras even, uh, involved uh, some, some energy savings uh, fundamentally. Um, and so even though electric, excuse me, total electricity use, uh, total energy use went up, um, the sorry, total electricity use was affected, total energy use went down and actually total electricity use on an annualized basis uh, declined in each of the scenarios. Next slide. Um, and that is this is another way to look at the same uh, information, not by end use, but by fuel. So in the electrification scenario, we're getting rid of the gas. And with the efficiency only scenario, the gas would remain, but there'd be less usage. <clears throat> and um, this also was this 
mixed fuel efficiency scenarios also kept in, I think is maybe a bit of an illustration of one of Mark Patterson's points that improving gas efficiency really has a, a, a benefit, but doesn't eliminate the emissions, doesn't eliminate the source of emissions that we were targeting. A uh, next slide. Um, and so, you know, there of course was uh, quite a bit more detail, but the outcomes I think really do fit on nicely on a bumper sticker. And they were, you know, our principal concern is, uh, does that, that the scale of that infrastructure, is it sufficient? And that's really a, determined by the annual peak demand. So we had a finding that the specific out day and hour of peak demand did shift because of the differing effects of the um, this electrification on the different building uses. So each district having a mix of different uses, the net result had a little bit different effect. At the same time, the in one district, uh, the peak demand increased 7%. And so that was significantly less than the remaining capacity of the existing infrastructure. And in another district, even essentially dumb electrification, but just with current uh, energy standards, resulted in a slight decrease in peak demand. So we, we definitely did not break this uh, model grid. Um, and then when we applied additional efficiency measures, we found there was a substantial opportunity to actually electrify and cut peak demand. Uh, so perhaps, for example, to uh, provide some more capacity to support electric vehicle charging, again, even in a, our today's um, simple one way, uh, just supplying power to the cars rather than, than uh, using the cars as a, a resource. Next slide. And so our key takeaways from that were, were it was, was helpful for basic public policy that we actually had a lot of value from data that was um, relatively simple data that was available publicly. And that gave us an opportunity to have some unique insights into the opportunities and performance of our local building stock and the grid. Um, we did underscore the value of efficiency, uh, but at the same time, uh, this did not support the notion that you have to do efficiency first. It's more that efficiency is highly beneficial, has a lot of, a lot of key benefits, but not necessarily a prerequisite for uh, advancing electrification. And then this last bullet is probably the most important um, this is a ultimately a pretty high level scenario analysis and is does not go into the level of detail that's necessary to actually plan out the grid. Um, so it was sufficient to address the question that recurring question we get from stakeholders and really isn't meant to usurp uh, any responsibility of PGE or imply we definitely don't don't are not intended to imply that there's no changes to the grid necessary, even in these two districts of electrification. You probably will, some some places will need a service upgrade or other modifications of on-site equipment, but high level, uh, this implies we can proceed without waiting for the, the grid to be upgrade, updated. Well, thanks for your time. All right. Well, I mean, that's promising news, right? It's like good, good to find out that um, this is feasible. And, um, you know, some of the, so to connect this back to what, you know, Mark had presented and to also connect it to what Melanie is going to be talking about is you know, this question is if the grid is ready and, you know, there's this other dimension of that, of, are we ready? Are we ready in our regulatory decisions and the advocacy and the success? And, you know, Mark has, um, made an analogy, like this is a, a I think a contest of ideas, or I think you put it some other ways. And as we've seen in some of those diagrams from Mark, the supply side and demand side, that line is blurring. And I'll borrow that from, you know, for example, like a Lorenzo Kristoff has really pointed that out. And we've seen that in the tidal nature of the grid in Australia. You know, at the same time, if we're asking people like in San Francisco to take action or, or do something, um, there's levels of reasons to do that. Um, in the European Union, they're talking about energy sufficiency, which is a really, really new concept. And they're studying the, the impacts of demand response in telling people to cook shorter meals or order Uber Eats. And that's coming out of an energy crisis in Europe with the gas supply shortage. Um, in a similar vein, to make this more tangible in the US Army, what we're going to hear from Melanie about what are these really important functions that need to happen? And where's their elasticity and, and not elasticity in terms of um, 
these functional needs of, of what we need to do, and also talk about the climate goals at the federal level and, and what the U.S. Army is doing about that. So really talking about that impact and, and magnitude um, also shapes our vision of how we address these in the built environment and can give us some ideas from a policy level and also gives us some ideas on the similar challenges that we have as local governments, which at the federal government um, you're experiencing too, and you can share your lessons on how you're addressing those. So, Melanie, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. So, I'm excited to uh, share some of what we think about and work on uh, in terms of Army and, and DOD uh, it's sort of grid modernization, although that's not usually the language we use around it. Uh, modernization in the Army can mean something really, really specific. And so, uh, it is grid modernization, but it's generally talked about in the context of developing better resiliency within our power systems. Let's go ahead and jump to that first slide. So I got really excited listening to Mark because I'm like, I am about to like jump into exactly the analysis that he started uh, to talk about at the beginning where he's like, you know, first we have to figure out where we are. So in the, in the DOD, starting between 2005 and 2007, we started to see a lot of policy emerge that directed both the DOD and federal facilities to adopt like renewable energy glide paths and energy efficiency measures all intended to improve our energy security was the terminology at the time. And we did a lot of work in the name of energy security. Uh, you'll find a lot of Army and DOD installations have utility scale uh, PV built on, on site within their fence lines. You will find uh, lots of energy efficiency measures taken within our buildings, lots of LEED uh, certifications in buildings. And you'll also start to see um, that we've, we've built like small demonstration scale or small um, subsets of the bases have some sort of isolation microgrid-like capability. Uh, but all of these projects have left a lot to be desired. So those utility scale solar projects Yes, they provide and reduce the amount of power we get from the grid, but they don't really provide the energy security that we were looking for because they're grid tied renewable systems, right? They don't offer that islanding capability. At the time, energy storage wasn't part of the, um, the thinking. And so what you'll find are just, you know, really large scale PV panels that require the grid um, to be online. So, they don't offer islanding capability. We have really limited connection with energy markets because of our cybersecurity requirements and, and that security posture. We have um, a lot of restrictions on how we can talk to and interact with energy markets. Um, we certainly can't link our control systems directly with any third party or exterior systems. So our control systems actually exist in physically isolated networks. Um, and most of our, our backup power continues to be spot generation that is geographically tied to a single building. Uh, because of our control systems being all isolated and you know, physically separated from each other, we still have really limited visibility about what's going on within our systems. Our SCADA systems tend to be extremely minimal, existing only like at maybe the substation level. Uh, we don't have integration between our systems and we have very limited facility meters. Uh, even now. It's gotten a lot better in the last decade, but we still have a lot of blind spots in, it terms, comes, uh, in terms of, you know, metering on our facilities. So just to give you a sense of, like, this is the current state that we have found ourselves with sitting here uh, around 2020, looking forward and saying, like, hmm, we're seeing a lot of demands from our policymakers. So let's go to the next slide. So what we've seen is that we have requirements coming from our policymakers, coming from our missions and our uh, required functionality on our bases that really outp outpace our existing capabilities. We have requirements for very high quality power with a very high level of reliability. Uh, we have a, a whole set of criteria that talks about how different missions and their criticality uh, equals nines of reliability. We have integrated a lot of distributed generation resources from that large scale utility solar to lots of rooftop solar systems. We have a wide variety of novel and interesting generation resources that have been scattered around the posts and demonstration projects. Um, and so they're out there, 
some of them are working, some of them are not, but we don't have a good way to keep track of or control or do anything other than just like, yeah, that, that's, that's over there. We know it's there. Um, we talked to, I mentioned our, our need for strong security postures. Our control systems have to be very well protected. Uh, and those that need for isolation and restricted access drives us to uh, these very restrictive environments in terms of what we can do and how we can integrate with other control systems and external systems. We'll talk in more detail about this resilience requirement in a couple of slides. We've seen emerging requirements in the last year or two to have our non-tactical vehicle fleets completely electrified, as well as decarbonizing and electrifying our buildings. So, um, seeing the need for all of that, we started to see it formally recognized in policy. Most uh, critically, that Army climate strategy in 2022 is driving a lot of what we're doing right now, but it's all based on that Army modern modernization strategy. Like I said, the word modernization and the Army is a loaded word. Um, our installation strategy, our energy and water strategic plan, installations face a lot of challenges because of where they're located and how isolated they can be in terms of supplying that kind of utility. Uh, and we also have very specific clauses in the National Defense Authorization Acts in 22 and 23, still waiting on 24, um, that really specify very specific activity in terms of developing microgrids for our installations. Let's head to the next slide. So taking a deeper look at the Army climate strategy in particular, the number one first line of effort top goal is that every installation will have a microgrid by 2035. And the, the driver behind that desire for a microgrid is to integrate those isolated distributed generation resources to give us the ability to operate disconnected from the grid and give us the flexibility to change the loads that we're supplying over the course of a long-term power outage. So what does this requirement actually mean? Well, it means that the Army needs to build 130 microgrids with priorities given to the, the bases that help us do our main job, which is force projection. Um, it's a bit of a euphemism, but it is what it is. So if we look at uh, the reporting and data collection that's done and how much energy the Army uses, uh, our installations consumed about 10.7 ter terawatt hours of electricity in FY22. It's roughly 29 gigawatt hours per day. Let's go to the next slide. So according to Army Directive 2020-3, we have to be able to support critical missions for 14 days without support from utility power. What does that mean? Well, that means we need 410 gigawatt hours of microgrid energy reserves present on our bases at any given time. That is a lot of energy, that is a lot of microgrids, and that is a lot of new complexity in our electrical distribution systems. My, my friend did math and calculated that that's 241 billion AA batteries, which I, I just thought it was funny. Um, <laughs> so to caveat this very back of the envelope math, not all of our missions are critical. Not every day looks the same in terms of energy consumption. Um, this calculation is really to give you a sense of the scale of the problem that we're trying to solve and, and the scale of this very ambitious goal that the Army has set. So as of February of this year, we had about 10 microgrids that somewhat contribute to these requirements. So between here and 2035, we have a lot of work to do. Next slide. So um, there's another document called the Army Climate Strategy Implementation Plan that lays out these glide paths. Um, I think this is not probably not terribly interesting to, to the audience here, um, but we will accomplish these goals uh, with a, a couple of different kinds of funding. One is like a military construction fund and the other is with working with third parties. At the moment, because these projects are really focused on resilience and not a return on investment, uh, that the, the huge bulk of the investment is being made with that military construction fund. All right, next slide. Um, I'm not gonna dig too deep into the, the project execution process there at the bottom. But in order to get all of this done, we have been working very hard at developing sort of standard criteria and practices that help us implement microgrids consistently across all of our bases. 
we joke in, in my team that uh, once you've seen one military base, you have seen one military base. There is almost no standardization across bases in terms of the electrical distribution system. I, um, we sort of, you have to keep in mind, like the, the DOD was built during the, the Cold War, basically, and it was built on a one-off basis all over the place. And so all of that infrastructure, um, it looks different at every post. Every post has different requirements. They have different environmental restrictions, historical um, site and landmark kind of restrictions. So every time you walk into a base, you really, uh, you're really brand new. Um, but we need consistent processes, consistent criteria, ways to evaluate and ways to design and develop these systems so that we get consistent results uh, across these multiple installations. So we have a, a unified facilities criteria on how to design uh, installation microgrids. We have a mill standard for tactical microgrid communications and controls that we're working on bringing up to the sort of utility distribution scale. And then we have a, uh, a document called a unified facility guide specification. <laughs> sorry, very DOD speak here, guys, I'm sorry. Um, that's about microgrid controllers and what do they, what's their functionality need to be, um, how, what data, there's a, a data model attached that we're borrowing from that mill standard 3071. Um, we'll dig a little deeper into each one of these in the next couple slides. Let's go to the next slide. So before we dig into those specific criteria, I wanted to take a look at a really high level of the key drivers and sort of key aspects of how we approach microgrid design for our installations. First and foremost, the microgrid needs to have a clearly defined objective, right? We go out to a base and the first objective is always meet that 14 day energy resilience requirement for critical loads. We keep those on for 14 days. But under what kind of threat, right? It's a very different microgrid if we're designing it to um, address known instability or known reliability issues within the utility grid or within the installation's own distribution system versus if we're trying to address the severe weather threat um, or some other kind of environmental condition. So we wanna make sure that we understand, yes, we need to meet the 14 day requirement, but what kind of threat are we addressing? We try to limit artificial constraints. Uh, when I, this is uh, me trying to nicely say, don't make political promises that affect your engineering design. Um, so we often find that a base, or there's been some discussion where, you know, this particular generation resource or this particular load has to be included in the microgrid design, and that's fine. We understand that this is how projects get done, um, but each of those is a limitation on how much trade space we have. So we will try to keep those to a minimum. We wanna do no harm to the installation's existing backup power posture, right? So they have existing backup power systems, those should all maintain functionality. We wanna improve our reliability every time. Um, and this, this begins to touch on this idea of that we borrow from our cybersecurity folks of defense in depth in terms of energy resilience. We like to make maintainable choices. So we wanna make, uh, we wanna make these easy to maintain. We wanna make sure we're selecting equipment the installation is familiar with because all of that builds us better long-term results. And finally, uh, we want to define the concept of operation or CONOP. Microgrids are systems that people interact with a lot. So we need to make sure that we are documenting who makes decisions, when do they make those decisions, who do they have to inform, how do they implement their, their decision in, in the microgrid control. So we, we try to work through not only the technical modes of operation, but how do we move between them in a people sense. Next slide. So thinking about that uh, energy resilience through defense in depth, what we need to accomplish is the ability to fall back and keep our critical loads on as our situation degrades. So if we lose that outer ring of utility power, we fall back to our base-wide power generation system. Maybe it's large-scale PV and energy storage. Maybe it's a combined heat and power plant. If for some reason we lose those capabilities as well, we fall back to our local distributed generation microgrids that are using resources located at the load. And if we lose that interconnection between the two, we fall back to generation that is co-located with our buildings. So this ability to fall back, this ability to keep going, even as we lose capability, is really important to how we think about microgrids. 
Next slide. So that UFC, a unified facilities guide, a unified facilities criteria, this document provides guidance to designers on how to approach microgrid design, what questions to ask, uh, how to sequence operations, what needs to be considered in commissioning and validation. It covers technical requirements for microgrids, their performance requirements, considerations for planning and design, uh, we said commissioning, uh, the sequence of operations and operations and sustainment. Let's head to the next one. I think most of this is fairly DOD specific. So in particular, to be considered a microgrid, once the, U the UFC is out for signature by the chief of engineers, uh, but once it's signed, to be considered a microgrid at a DOD installation, you will need to be a bounded system. We have to have a clearly defined boundary that contains generation, distribution, and control. You will have to be able to island from the utility system with at least the ability to integrate more than one generation resource. So not, they don't necessarily have to be present, but the capability has to be. Uh, we need to be capable of black start. So even if the microgrid has blinkless ride through for an unexpected outage, they still have to be able to stand the microgrid back up from a black condition. Um, it has to balance generation and load, this basic power systems functionality, right? Uh, and we need to meet those energy resilience requirements. I've talked about the 14-day requirement. To be considered a microgrid, you have to be working towards that requirement. And it varies between the different DOD services. So the way it's written, it's uh, whatever service you're in, you meet your services requirement. Fail safe operation, that's that idea of defense in depth. We wanna be able to return to old backup power systems if we lose our new ones. It has to be able to get authority to operate, that's a DOD cybersecurity accreditation thing. Um, and it has to work exclusive of novel technology. So a lot of microgrid demonstrations and uh, have always contained really interesting generation resources or uh, very nascent control systems. And we wanted in this UFC to specify that we can't keep doing that. We need to make sure that these systems are reliable, functional, and maintainable. Um, so we're looking for more commercial off the shelf kind of technology rather than uh, developmental systems. Next slide. So we also have a number of things that will exceed the criteria, but are somewhat encouraged based on the different kinds of loads. So a blinkless transition between uh, uh, grid tied operation and islanded operation. Um, that means no interruption in power. That would be considered exceeding the criteria, including energy storage is exceeding the criteria. Um, more than two redundant grid forming assets. Um, you have to have at least two HMI front end. So you, if you have more than two, you exceed it. Um, and then more than two black start resources. Uh, and load shedding is considered an exceeding criteria just because we don't have that much control over our distribution systems. Um, and being able to operate parallel to the grid is also considered a um, exceeding capability. All right, let's go to the next one. Um, again, emphasizing this idea of defense in depth, all of our network backup power is complementary to the facility dedicated backups. This idea um, has, has been somewhat controversial, right? Because we're not saving our maintenance and sustainment dollars by making this the requirement, right? Maintaining those backup power systems at a facility level is expensive and we are basically specifying that we have to keep doing that. Uh, looking at the microgrids as an additional layer rather than a replacement for those systems. Okay, let's go to the next one. So the tactical microgrid standard or MIL standard 3071 was initially developed for tactical microgrids. So, um, Power and energy in the Department of Defense is really sort of split into two camps, power and energy for stationary installations and power and energy for things that move around. So 3071 was developed for the stuff that moves around. These systems tend to be made up of um, these standard generator sets and these uh, distribution boxes that are um, <laughs> they're like 
they're like big multi-pole switches, but they're mobile. You can throw them down on the ground and the cables run over the ground. Um, the original 3071 was designed at only user voltage. They don't take magnetics into the field, so there's no transformation up and down of voltage. It's all just 120. Um, so what 3071 includes, though, is a complete data model, like a points list for a microgrid controller. And so we have been evaluating and working with the folks that developed this in my lab and at a, another Army lab called C5 ISR. I don't, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't recall the, the acronym. Um, it, it was developed in partnership between my lab and theirs. So we're looking at how do we move it up to our installation grid scale microgrids. Next slide. And finally, the control system UFGS. So it provides a framework uh, for microgrid controllers. It's intended to be technology neutral so that it's not saying, you know, one kind of controller versus another, but it does list uh, communications requirements, all the different kinds of systems they have to be able to interface with, the functionality they have to be able to provide. Um, and in particular, the UFGS is considering using the points list that I mentioned in that uh, MIL standard 3071 for uh, installation scale microgrids. So this was required in that um, National Defense Authorization Act of 2023. So we will have a draft complete to comply with Congress's requirement uh, by the end of next month. You know, the one that starts in two days. <laughs> it's been a very fast development effort. All right, let's go to the next one. So, you know, we're doing all of this work. We're working on figuring out how do we build microgrids for our installations, but we recognize that we're already sort of addressing last, year, last year's requirements, right? These aren't standing still. Uh, that requirement to have electrified non-tactical vehicle fleets changes the entire equation around what loads are critical and how much power do they use. So our research side effort, so I, I work in a, a research laboratory, but uh, I work a lot on this construction of these systems, which is a little atypical, but I also have a, a side of my team that works on a, a more research kind of basis. So our research side is looking at, you know, how do we forecast um, those vehicle electrification loads? We have our non-tactical vehicles, yes, which will look just like all of the um, private sector vehicles it'll look really similar, but we also have to consider um, tactical vehicles and their charging requirements. And so we know that some of those requirements look like, uh, hey, I have a bunch of vehicles, they just pulled up, they want to charge completely in 15 minutes and each one of them requires about a megawatt to do that and there's 15 of them. So please provide us that power now. That's a big ask, right? That's gonna take creative solutions or brute force ones like energy storage and capacitor banks. Um, we know that building electrification will push that base load up. Uh, if we eliminate fuel generation, how do we create a microgrid that is going to run for 14 days and be very reliable? That's a, a challenging controls question. Um, we have a, a microgrid in California that is entirely inverter resource uh, based um, and it is in its final stages of construction. So that'll be about a eight megawatt microgrid that's only PV and batteries. I'm excited to see um, that one be commissioned and tested. And we'll have to so. take a tour in California if there's any. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there's a little time check. We're just uh, looking at Oh, the I'm so sorry. Yeah, I am okay. done. This is my last slide. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Well, that was one just fascinating because it's a, a lot of information we don't usually get. So, I mean, and it really makes um, our jobs at the local government level look look very doable compared to the challenges that you're facing. And it <laughs> really gives us a lot of fodder in terms of some of these slides could be made into a checklist for an RFP or really tell us mm -hmm. why and how to approach microgrids and what's important. So connecting that future state, like Mark talked about in the very beginning, um, is something that we can learn from on how you're doing that. So it'd be great to keep in touch. And if there's any California specific things, we'd always love to um, collaborate. But this also shows just the, the many facets that we have to think about as we think about microgrids and LGSCC is definitely here to help wrangle this. So don't at all be 
um, for the audience thinking that you're going to need to be an expert in all these. Um, but to def tie the need of the defense systems and, and the U.S. Army, um, we need to take that equally to heart with our communities and our neighbors and our families and, and our, our local um, constituents. So to speak about that, we're going to have Stephen bring us home here. And um, if the um, panelists can start answering some of those questions in the chat, as a reminder, um, just the, the nature of the Zoom today, we're going to do them all um, a little verbally at the end and then also in the Q&A box. So I'd invite the panelists to tackle some of those questions. So uh, Stephen, go for it. Thanks, Mark. And that was really great. I, I feel like we took a journey from the global perspective to citywide to national security. And now, as you said, Mark, we're going to bring this home to where it sort of matters to the end user, the customer, um, and in particular, um, the program that Electric Power uh, is, is bringing out to market um, called Sustainable Community Networks. And how we are bringing the SCN, we call it SCN because the world needs more acronyms. Uh, SCN is actually something that does a lot for a bunch of different constituencies. Um, but the bottom line is, Deploying systems helps the end user, and if you do it correctly, we hope, is a part of the solution to getting to a better future grid. Um, so my name is Stephen Honickman. I am involved in business development at Electric Power. Um, and Electric is a smart home battery uh, OEM. Um, it's, a, it's a great home battery, but this isn't about the product as much as it is how we're taking that to market through what we are finding to be a really innovative and and starting to get some good traction um, approach to making sure that these solutions are available to the communities that are most deserving of them, uh, underserved, um, disadvantaged communities in particular. And actually that mission that electric power um, really includes in its, it's, it's, it is our mission is to equity and inclusion in the clean energy transition is our tagline. Um, it's not just a bumper sticker. It's actually the SCN program is our articulation of that mission into the market. And you can go to the next slide. Um, I'll, I'll jump right in here. And these are pretty short and quick. Um, but before I even get into this, I want to just say hello and, and thank you to a couple of our um, our partners who are already uh, signed up with a program. Um, this program launched, we piloted it in a disadvantaged community in the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, part of the reason we did that there was that community, it's the town of Parlier, uh, was one of the epicenters of solar fraud in the 20 teens. And we decided really a part of our overall mission was to make sure that we could bring some um, trust back into the solar uh, community. Because we've done a good job in the solar market of poking ourselves in the eye. And sometimes we deserve the reputation of being used car salesmen. So SCN is really intended to flip that script. And, and to do that, we go out of our way to really uh, partner with a local stakeholder. And it is that partnership with a local stakeholder that is key to our ability to bring a program to a community which rightly might have a jaundiced view of uh, the guy walking up their street, uh, up their driveway, trying to get them to sign up for a, a solar array that they don't really have a lot of understanding with. So um, Parlier was where we piloted this. Um, we are now serving Santa Barbara, Goleta, Carpinteria, San Luis Obispo County. Uh, we have deployments in Ventura and uh, just very recently welcome to the town of Apple Valley, um, who is our most recent um, uh, partner in this program. So thank you guys for what you've done. I noticed a bunch of you are, are online and we have a bunch of other good um, partnerships with other community-based organizations like the energy coalition that Mark has, has referenced, we've been working with them for a while trying to figure out how to bring this partnership approach to uh, it to market. Um, and um, we join organizations that help us um, make the trust in the program easier for our end customers that are the end users of electricity uh, to know they can move forward with us. And that's through a public-private partnership approach where we are going to be establishing a relationship with an entity, be it a local government or a community-based organization that we share common goals with. Um, that common goal, there's many of them, but the key common goal is basically to ensure that especially low to moderate income um, constituents can access 
these clean energy transition uh, technologies. Um, the SCN program is broad in that it can include anything that a local community is already doing. So if there's a, a climate action plan that has been written or is being revised and it has goals that are articulated, we want to bring those into the SCN um, program that we're bringing to your community so that you can actually have a private company that is good at doing outreach. That is, that is, if we don't do outreach well, uh, means we aren't selling our product and we are a for-profit company and we don't apologize about that. But we want to make sure that the the profit that we make is done in a way that is transparent and there's no gotchas and that everyone who is involved, both us as a private company, the public good that the agency that we're partnering with um, is is able to bring to their constituents and the end user are all going to come out. So it's that that cliche win, win, win. But in fact, it, it really is. Um, when it works well, everyone is coming out the way we hope this would be done Um if we could reinvent that grid from 100 years ago today uh, and, and do things in a way that actually deliver sustainable energy that is generated on site, that is resilient in its ability to be delivered because we include a battery in every system. We actually are installing a microgrid on every home that we connect uh, into, the, into the program. Um, and that energy is available through a power purchase agreement at an affordable rate. So there is no minimum credit score there's no income requirement, there's no deposit, there's no property liens. It's a very easily transferable PPA. And all those things that I just said make it sound too good to be true. So the key feature that when we partner with an agency, we wanna make sure they're able to help us achieve is to really make sure that there's there's none of this like, well, where's the catch? Um, one of, when, I, when I present this to a local agency, one of my favorite questions is when they say, well, where's the catch? I'm like, please help me find it. Um, I've been working at this program now for three years. We keep finding um, things that are are even better than we originally thought they were because when you line up the incentives and the and the approach to things, it starts to really um, work uh, with everyone aligned in in a, in a common goal. So next slide. Um, the the goals here, obviously, as I just mentioned, are are common. We want to reduce carbon loads. Uh, we want to make sure that people have power when they most need it. And we want to make sure that communities that are dealing with, you know, especially disadvantaged communities that are dealing with um, air quality issues or or uh, they would like to get off of their fossil gas heating systems. These are all things that we can do under the SCN program and tailor how that SCN program is brought to your constituents in a way that is hyper local and tuned to your particular constituency's needs. Uh, the one common denominator for the program is we deploy a solar microgrid on a home um, and you can go to the next slide. Um, those systems are gonna have between four and 10 kilowatts of PV capacity on the roof, um, a 10, 15 or 20 kilowatt hour uh, energy storage system um, installed with that. And I was enjoying going down um, uh, Melanie's checklist of what makes a microgrid because one of our internal running conversations is should we say, that we deploy solar plus storage, or should we say we deploy microgrids? I'm a microgrid nerd, so I have a particular viewpoint on that. I think we should call them microgrids. Um, those who get to decide how we call these things when we go out into the market are the, the right people to listen to from making sure that customers understand what they're getting. And so solar plus storage might be the easier term to digest. Um, but our systems do almost everything the military wants for its bases. We don't last 14 days. Um, we last as long as there is sunshine the next morning, we'll recharge the battery. If there is no sunshine, the battery would eventually go dead if the grid was out. So that's an issue, but we black start, we do load control. We can turn the battery on and off based on what the grid needs as well. So we can participate in grid services, uh, components as well. Um, but as I already mentioned, the, the key to the SCN approach is to really allow the partnership to guide how we're gonna tune the offering in that community. Um, not up for debate is that the PPA is key to ensuring that the constituents and the, the agency's constituents and our, we hope, customers won't have a financial barrier that prevents them from participating. So um, this isn't, and by the way, just for those of you who have been around for a while, this is not PACE. Uh, sometimes when I know that I've been talking to someone who's come out of the PACE program and has a bad taste in their mouth, I often will start with just to 
put people's shoulders at ease. This is not pace. It's a PPA. <laughs> um, and it's a turnkey approach to delivering the community an offering that the city or the agency or the CBO can know that they are helping bring into their community. And at the end of the day, the end user is signing that PPA because they believe it's the right thing for them to do for their home. It's a behind the meter system. Um, and we had to deal with NEM2 to NEM3 switches and all the export issues that have come up recently. And we're trying to electrify at the same time. And those are jurisdiction to jurisdiction. The program though is at its core, something that offers a clean and smart energy solution behind the meter to the end user. Um, and, and that's really in keeping with our goal of ensuring equity and inclusion in the transition and ensuring that the transformation of the grid at the broadest level um, is made up of the, the bi-directionality that Mark uh, mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. So next slide. Um, this really is um, stuff I've already covered, so I'll skip through it in the interest of time. Um, when we come to a community, the community will have reviewed the, the standard PPA to confirm on their own that there's no property lien, that there's no minimum credit score, um, all the things that you might raise your eyebrow and say, that sounds too good to be true. We want the participant, the partner who's participating in the program to validate that and get comfortable with it on their own. Um, that in fact, the PPA is what we claim it is. And only then after they've validated it, do we offer it into the community. Um, that is why we don't offer this before the partner agency has reviewed it. We could go offer this wherever we wanted, um, but our whole point is, Let's get in our own way and slow this down so that as we go to market, it is done with that trusted validation from a local agency that's aligned with common goals and hopefully has some trust established with their community because the community is in line with what they're all trying to achieve as a local community. Um, there is no upfront cost, full stop. Um, we install the, the system, the solar on the roof, the battery on the, on the side of the house. Uh, we'll do a main service panel upgrade if we can. Um, recently, one of the things um, I'll just throw out there, a, a throwaway that we're trying to figure out how to start doing is including roof replacements. Um, in as much as we are all now aware of the need for sustainability, there's there's effectively no money out there for roof replacements. And yet, if you are going to install something that's going to last a long time and is an infrastructural upgrade to a home, let's make sure that roof is being replaced. So I'm actually actively looking for conversations with our our, our current partners and the ones who are you know, in the wings and are coming down the line with us, how can we make sure that when there's an opportunity to install one of these systems and electrify a home that we start out by getting the roof replaced? It's a really nice catalyzing way of using dollars, maybe from the public sector to ensure that we have a good substrate on which to electrify an entire home. Um, as I've mentioned, there's no incomes, there's no credit score, there's no deposit, there's no property lien. Um, and except for things like we will not do an installation um, if there's only a north facing roof, right? Or if they're under trees, we, this gets into topics of like why we want to work also with uh, community solar developers, if we can, um, not every home has access to the same sunshine. Now that's no one's fault. It's just the physical realities of the world, but we'd like to make sure that any home that can have enough sunshine landing on it can have a system installed and, and get the benefits of these systems behind their meter and, and for their own use. Um, next slide. Um, once we've come into a community, the, the approach is basically to recognize that what we're doing is opening up access to those who didn't have access to it before. If you could buy your own system, you may have already done so. Uh, if you had a decent credit score, you were probably able to finance this if you wanted to go solar and install a, a system. Um, we are opening access to people who don't have access to the capital themselves or the credit to have these systems installed. And that gives them an improved quality of life. And that if we do that in, at scale in a community, it has a benefit to the overall health of the community. I probably don't need to belabor that to this group. We're all involved in that same sort of campaign of, of improving community health. Um, we are, I'm a big fan of the resiliency efforts that the state of California has gone on to create community resiliency centers. Um, one of the lines I've, I've really enjoyed when I've gone to the meetings about community resiliency centers is that recognition that resiliency actually starts at home. And if you don't have to go to the resiliency center because your home is actually a place you can shelter in place during an extended either climate disaster or just PSPS event because of an outage um, or PSPS related outage, great, shelter in place. Um, 
And that resiliency, hopefully, because the batteries are dispatchable and can be deployed and, and used to support the grid, actually makes the grid more stable in the first place, making those outages hopefully less likely. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the homes become a refuge. They are a place for sheltering and you're, you're able to you know, keep your, your loved ones safe in your home um, and make sure that you are able to not be a drain on the public resources that are scarce. Let's face it, we never really have enough when we really need it. So if you don't need to be straining that um, resource because you can stay at home, that's that's a, a net positive for what we're trying to do here. So next slide. Um, solar is growing very quickly. And a part of my background is, is the financing for larger commercial industrial systems. Um, I'm also very interested in the regulatory aspect of things. And I spend a lot of time reading boring papers um, at our company. A lot of people send me stuff. Please read this because I will fall asleep if I do. Um, so I'll go through those things and try to figure out how to help continue triangulating in, in the right ways to have regulation and the very rapid growth of solar become valuable assets on the grid. Um, and that regulation is key to that. Um, rather than having what the utilities currently look at is just, oh, there's more solar, it's not dispatchable, it's gonna be a pain in the butt, we're not gonna be able to deal with this non-dispatchable resource. Um, and so this is something that is both a challenge and an opportunity. And we're really excited for, as we get into scale of these things, being able to really address like the proverbial duck curve, help shave peaks, uh, and make sure that the solar resources that are being deployed are actually a part of a dispatchable generating mix. Um, so and I'll give the official uh, two-minute warning. Here is the oh, we're, that's the, it. I think I think I think that's it. There's I think you have minute. one more slide, but go ahead. It's a little time check. I I think you have one more, and we'll go ahead. Next slide. Start closing it out. Yeah, no. This is in conclusion. <laughs> um, we're really interested in trying to make sure that the low to moderate income community has access to these transitions, to, has access to the clean energy transition. Uh, this is not exclusively offered to them. And one of the key features here is there are a lot of good programs out there that make these kinds of technologies available for the, the very poorest among us. But if you're making just too much money, you're actually disqualified from participating in a lot of those truly free um, programs. And we wanna make sure that those folks have access to something too. So our PPA, it, you do you do get charged per kilowatt hour, but it's a price that starts below even the subsidized rates for those IOU um, subsidized tariffs. So you're coming out of it already went you know already savings, um, and those systems then become a part of the behind the meter asset that the end user can use when there's an outage, but also is a part of the front of meter solution that is a part of the future grid. And I'll end by saying this is a public private partnership. And so anyone who's listening up, who wants to learn more information about it, uh, let me know. We'd love to see if there's a fit for you in, in your community. We work with city governments, community-based organizations, CCAs, um, and we'd love to figure out how to bring it to your community. So we love, appreciate the chance to uh, contribute to this conversation. Great. Well, thanks, Stephen. I mean, this is, I mean, you've kind of cracked the nut here and you know, it shows. So this is um, really exciting and engaging local governments. Um, and just helping those that need it. So uh, we've kind of drank through the fire hose today. You, um, this is the beginning of what can be, you know, a decade of change, or if we kind of go with some change theory and we're strategic about it, we can really shave that time down by working with, with all the presenters um, and learning from them. So um, we'll get some of those answers out in the chat. Um, you know, Mark, a special thanks to you. I know i um, time constrained, but um summing this up i mean kelsey you can make some final comments mark i see you're off mute any just final observations as the you know person from the other side uh yeah thanks mike um and, and we're ending quick. um just in a couple of minutes if people can hang on but um and then we'll wrap up after that yeah real quick uh, obviously a ton of relevant content uh on both sides of the pacific um, I think that, um, you know, a lot of really good commentary that's that's occurred there. And I, I think the real challenge for you all, as it is everywhere, is um, how, do, how do you actually democratise this discussion such that uh, if we're looking to a lot of our traditional governance mechanisms to do this kind of, you know, bigger picture thinking and, and everything that follows practically, we may be waiting a long time. 
So I think it, it comes down to a question of how do you all, um, you know, kind of uh, position to kind of uh, lead lead that debate uh, in a more comprehensive way. So, uh, you know, we're just, in summary, we're, we're finding as is everywhere globally that a lot of that leadership needs to come from the grassroots uh, in a 100 year old system. Well, those are the perfect parting thoughts. And with that, uh, in respect of people's time, uh, we'll sign off here and we'll we'll sh circulate all the content and slides and just a big thanks to not only the speakers, but to the new members and also a lot of new faces that have called in um, that got the message through uh, whatever channel it reached you. But I uh, really appreciate it. And we hope to see you on January 10th. Um, and uh, for those in person that can make it and um, We'll talk to you soon, so thank you.